It's doing that thing again. There we go. I have a headlight. I just put an LED bulb in on one side. Can you tell which one it is? Is it obvious? Which one do you think? Hmm. In the last video about the Hyundai, we took it racing and you saw my intermittent headlight thing happen. With as dim as the incandescent bulbs in it are, having one headlight go out at night is very dangerous. And because there are LED equivalents for most bulbs available today that are more efficient, maybe I can make myself more visible on the road and see a little bit better in the process. I have the same intermittent bulb thing going on with some of the tail light sockets too, and for whatever reason, my Fonzarelli fix isn't working on camera for that one now. Okay, cool. But you should expect all of what I'm about to show you on a 30 year old car. And all my efforts in this video are in an attempt to pass my state inspection legally. My reverse lights were out, and it's a multifaceted problem, but one being the old bulb sockets have basically turned into chalk. That white thing at the base is supposed to be about four times bigger than that. It's supposed to hold the bulb into the brake light housing, and you can see that it's still crumbling and falling apart. Junk. I bought more junk to replace it with off of Amazon. The reverse light's a single filament 1156 bulb, and I bought a four pack of these universal things that look like what was already there. Surprisingly, they almost fit it too. It was about 11 bucks shipped and I got what I paid for. I've already got it prepped with some waterproof heat shrink insulation and I think I can work with them to get my inspection sticker. I'll show you what I did to correct it later, but before I do anything else, I'll need to replace both of my reverse light bulb sockets so they aren't just laying inside the housing anymore. The bulbs do get hot and that'll melt the tail light lens if the bulb touches it. These won't be easy tail lights for me to find at all to replace, so I'm right on that one. I'm not doing anything terribly fancy with the wiring, nothing you haven't seen me do before. I just cut off the bad connector, strip the leads, twist them together, and use copper crimp connectors to attach them. Next comes the waterproof heat shrink that actually does have a small amount of low melt solder in it, which I really don't need, but I'd rather it be easy to do and waterproof too. Yeah, well, don't judge me. The 1156 bulb sockets are really easy to figure out with only two wires. You know, put the black ones together. They go together. The 1157 sockets have two positive leads and one negative lead because they have dual filament bulbs. The black ground wires still go together on those two, but there's two positive circuits on that kind. If you're replacing that one, turn off your autopilot. You need to pay a little bit more attention to their orientation because the brake lights and the corner lights will be out of phase if you get it wrong, and that'll be weird. That's a stupid problem to have. I don't plan to replace anything that isn't broken here, and the 1157 sockets look okay. I'm going to replace the bulbs first because I'm hoping that the short is in the bulb and not the socket. It usually is the case. These old school 1156 and 1157 single and dual filament bulbs have been the mainstay of automotive exterior lighting for decades, and they're all I found inside my Hyundai's brake light housings. Eight of them. But now there's newer, more efficient technology available that plugs right in as a direct replacement for those 1156 and 1157 bulbs, so I might as well give her an upgrade. LEDs are more efficient, and this makes them brighter while consuming less current. But older car circuits are designed around the inefficiencies of the older incandescent bulb. Incandescent bulbs also don't care which way the current flows through them like LEDs do, so even though they plug right in and fit the sockets, you need to ensure that they function the way they're supposed to on your car. And there you go, right off the bat, ludicrously bright turn signals. Because of the Euro headlights, my corner marker lights on the front of the car and the signal lights share duty on the same bulb. That yellow corner marker light ain't going to fly for me. You can see when I put the key in and flip the, the turn signal up, the left dash blinker is already lit up, and it's not blinking. And nothing changes on that rear corner marker light either. All of this is because the LEDs lack all of the resistance that the factory designed bulbs have. The blinker relies on that resistance to make the circuit cycle the light on and off, and it's not there, so the light doesn't blink. The inspector won't care what kind of bulbs I have in here as long as they all work correctly. That's not a bulb that I was having any issues with before this. What I had here before would already pass state inspection. 
So that's really not a wheel that I need to reinvent. It's more helpful to me for my brake lights and parking lights to be more visible in traffic. And it's far more helpful to have both headlights working. I'm having problems with that one right there going in and out, but it's not doing it right now. I'm going to change the bulbs out. Personally, I hate LED light. It doesn't matter if it's in my house, at work, or on the road. It's garbage quality light to me. The LEDs that we all use for lighting everything in our lives these days spends 80 to 90 percent of their duty cycle making no light at all off. They just flicker fast enough that it looks like there's a continuous light there. Most people can't perceive this, but I do. I can't read by LED light because it causes eye strain for me. It gives me a headache. But since I can't see my taillights from my driver's seat, only everyone else's, and they all already have them, then I might as well annoy them and give them headaches and traffic right back. Your eyes always are going to adjust to the available light, and when you have oncoming traffic, you put yourself at risk with night driving if your headlights can't compete with the other cars coming towards you. The road in front of you will seem to disappear. That's a lesson this car has taught me the hard way. But when you're cruising with other cars that are behind you, or stopped. The same applies to their ability to see your taillights easily. If your lights are dimmer than everyone else's, it can make it harder for them to see you, whether you're moving or not, especially whenever weather is less than perfect and they're staring into their phone. Yeah, so even if you hate the quality or spectrum of light LEDs provide, they're still safer and more efficient, so they're an upgrade that the Luddites among us with older cars should probably consider. I'll figure out the blinkers another day. It's an easy fix that I already showed on screen. I just don't need to do it to pass my state inspection. It was my brake and parking lights that were being flaky, and the reverse light sockets that became literally flaky enough to shatter. Well, the LED bulb isn't blinking out when you bump it anymore. Only way to fully test it and make sure it's not the wiring is to put it back on the road. So I might as well put all the other odds and ends back together again so that we can do that and give all the bulbs a final run through and inspection before I waste a state inspector's time. They're gonna do all of this. Make sure every light works, with the headlights on or off, and that they blink no matter which relay does all the blinking. High beams, low beams, third brake light bulb, license plate bulbs, check them all. You need to check this on both the front and the back of the car and do the same routine because opened or closed short circuits can affect other bulbs. A common problem with the 1156 and 1157 bulbs, like I showed you in this video, is that they can fit in the same socket. But if you put the wrong bulb in it, you can feed power back into other lighting circuits. It's a stupid problem to have, but I don't have it. I see a lot of cars on the road that do, though. I really do like the contrast of these incandescent corner markers versus the LED headlights and brake lights. It's just kind of smooth. It all works. Everything looks great to me. You may have noticed this whole time that my car's been sitting on scales. I promise I wasn't checking the corner balance measurements before and after my new LED bulbs. No, no. This is for a completely different reason. We corner balanced this car before I discovered the broken transmission mount. And after we fixed it, it seems that we've moved about 30 pounds of weight over to the front driver's side wheel. That was what I was really trying to check. This is something that I wanted to have correct before I took the car for a precision alignment. I know we really did do well with that you know, whole thing we did to align this thing, but you know, I know we left some room for improvement too, because we know the floor isn't perfectly level. I decided that this has to be right, and as right as it can be for science, and now all the work that I can do to get it there is now done. We got 849 and 841. We now have the front end within eight pounds, which, you know, on a street driven car is more than close enough for me. Everything changes once you add a passenger or your groceries. Now, now that that's taken care of, here's what the lighting upgrade looks like at night. For now, until I can get the resistors for the blinkers figured out, if I do that. These Euro headlights have safety lamps so that motorcyclists can perceive the width of your car in the event that a headlight bulb goes out. Brilliant safety feature if you ask me, but with these glass headlight lenses and new LED bulbs, I'll be able to see fine at night no matter how few amps my electrical system's capable of generating. 
I'm loving this mod because for a good while I refused to drive this car at night because I couldn't see. It greatly increases its usefulness to me, especially since it doesn't have AC. Now for the icing on the road legal and safety and comfort cake. I dropped it off with Jeff at RPM again for its third alignment. We got a uh, 2011 MacBook Pro 13 inch. Meet Tunesis. Tunesis is my tuning laptop. It helps me tune my car. Tunesis has developed a little problem. This is one of the old track pads that's supposed to be able to click. The battery's swollen up so much that I've lost my click and I know that's the only thing it can be. So I went online and I grabbed some stuff to keep this old laptop alive. It's all my car needs. It's a small laptop and I appreciate that about it. It has phenomenal battery life because I put an SSD in it and that SSD with a fresh battery I've seen it before I've gotten eight hours out of this thing which is better than most new computers so let me uh, see what we've got here hmm. you can't tune without a without a new battery so um, yeah I'm gonna go ahead and crack into this thing it's very thoughtful of them to include screws and looks like it came with a few other tools. Uh, I guess I don't even have to hunt for tools. I have to go get mine because it already has them. Cool. I'm down. I got to give this kit some credit. The screw kit's a very nice plus because I'd lost three of mine over the years. It's a nice touch. I have all these specialty tools, but I'm done already and I didn't have to look for them anywhere. Yeah, you can see the Apple battery's all swollen up right here. It's all bulged out. That's what did it right under the trackpad. So let's take the, um, yeah, let's go ahead and put this thing in there and see what happens. It had everything to do this job anywhere I might be for under 40 bucks. We'll see how it works the next tuning or race day. Give the thing a full test. Yeah, it's got a couple bars. Come on, Tunsis. Yay! Got a tuning laptop again. Oh, my lens is all fogged up. Fantastic, it's all finished. So, had a little problem with the passenger side window regulator falling down into the door and kind of screwing up my program on the way up here, but I got another one already and the car's finished, so I'm gonna take it home and put that window regulator in. This goes in there. It's a straightforward install that you've watched me do before. You might remember it fell down at the track once and sent me home because I couldn't roll it up. This car eats passenger side window regulators is all. Behold, that moment when. When you realized you ordered the manual regulator for your powered window car. Hmm. I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little bit spoiled by this. What you do is you take two parts and you make one out of it. You see where the wheel is right there? Mm. And that thing, that's the part that breaks. Are you even a DSMer if you haven't had to engineer your own parts? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Helps when you buy the right regulator, though. It does. It does. Would have been smart of me. But the thing did say only seven left in stock. Order soon. So I knew right then, I just needed to jump right on that buy now button and be a dumbass. In my experience, they ship without the electric motor, so the picture didn't really look so different to me, didn't stop me. Man, I messed up. I was ready to rage quit, but Abe and Matt were up here with me and didn't let me. I'm thankful. The way these things are constructed, they're cable driven on fragile plastic guides and the pulleys for the cable are riveted onto the frame after the slider is installed, so they're completely non-serviceable. That certainly makes things tricky, but it's not impossible. Using all the correct and incorrect tools, they had the patience to figure it out when I didn't. Well, thank you for talking me out of ordering the right part. 
This fixes my problem today without the hassle of returning anything so that I can get on with my life. It was a $30 problem either way I cut it. This isn't even something that I have to fix for a Virginia State inspection either. They only specify the driver's side window. But with no AC, this has to work. And I know that this car will fail for some other stupid reason if I don't fix it. I have a working catalytic converter. Good brakes, ball joints, horn, lights, tires, mirrors, seat, and every original part working on this old car, despite all of its modifications, that were carefully chosen so that I would comply with my state's laws and regulations. Street car. I just legit passed Virginia safety inspection with a 30 year old bottom shelf import. There might be a few cars out there you'd expect to be able to do that with, but this is not one of them. There's no better way to test my new state inspection sticker than legally driving my car 50 minutes down the road to my nearest track and pay $25 for what they call a test and tune event. I left my house at 4.30 p.m. but didn't make it to the tech lanes until 5.45. Time to run started at 6 p.m. There's a number of things wrong with this day and you'll see it all play out. I even play a role in it. But for starters, the first pass once time to runs began happened while I was sitting here in the tech lanes and the guy ended up on his lid at the end of the track. They pulled the tech inspector for that cleanup and the tech lanes stacked up an eighth mile long for two lanes over the hour before inspections resumed. I know the track's not responsible for people who experience failures and crashes. They're just trying to provide us a nice place to have our equipment failures and crashes. I appreciate them, and I understand that there's things we can all do better. Nobody in this video is exempt from that advice, and I hope we all keep trying. I have very limited options now that my local track is closed, and understand the value of having a place to do this. I went straight to the staging lanes from Tech and sat for another hour before my lanes started moving. I watched lanes 1 and 2 get cleared out twice while I waited and wondered what was going on. I discovered there was an unadvertised, unscheduled bracket racing competition running right over top of our event. Link to the event in the description. No mention of it anywhere. Everyone who came for test and tune got milked. They all got between 0 and 2 passes. They ran Outlaw, No Time, Motorcycles, Junior Dragster next, then the bracket race all the way through the quarterfinals before they even let me move again. He's moving because he wants to go home. Aww. So don't move. I still got to run all those lanes over there. Okay. So it's going to be a little bit. Oh, I'm sad. Everyone in the staging lanes is furious by this point except for me. I've seen this happen here too many times already. I know the guy in the AMG GTC leaving ruins someone else's day a lot worse than mine. Oh, and Guess here he what? comes. All these cars are moving up one. What happened? All these cars are moving up one because he got more than once to go home. Yeah, he didn't want to race me. He's going home. Wow. I mean, so what is that lady say? Are we are we next? No, she said she had she had to run all the cars on the far lanes That's over there. Running, running all the ones in the far lane. That's just, I guess the lady is going. They may come back three and four. Yep. That's what test and tune gets here. Ridiculous. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. I get lined up to that damn eclipse. That's what I was warning Son about. Bitch. Hey, don't feel bad. Don't feel bad. I don't think he'll make a second pass tonight. I'm going to tell him to move to the front to raise your ass. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure he'd love to. That would be awesome. So after a four hour wait, I'm finally getting my first pass. You can hear my power steering belt doing that thing again. Guys, I'm done with hydraulic power steering. Over it. Going electric. Hunting for parts. It's sad that my last fix only lasted about 200 miles for me being right back to where I was before the belt squeal. It's a nightmare to work on and service that on this car. I sound calm, but in reality, being up first, I scramble to get my seat belt and helmet on, windows rolled up, two cameras running, my laptop connected and logging in time, and all the unnecessary electrical things in my car turned off. You know, all those things that were set perfectly before my lane got stopped two hours ago.
Right out of the burnout box, pulling up to the beams, I made my single biggest mistake of the whole night. I mistook the black streaks in front of me for rubber and lined up straddling the wrong groove instead of being right in the middle of it. I chalked that up to being out of practice because I know better and I never even second guessed what I thought I saw. I needed to be about two feet more over the right. to discover everything other than me that went wrong on that pass, I pulled over in the pits and first I pondered what was going on with all my friends behind me. Turns out KD broke an axle and that's driving Chad Leary's car. Let's see how this one goes now. the guy in the Shelby Cobra, because the guys in Shelby Cobras always have a good time. That's just how it works. They just ride off into the sunset in their big block convertible coupe. That's what they do. Don't knock until you've tried it, because it's awesome. But for me, that pathetic time slip, even for this car, tells me that I totally pooched the launch and the video told me exactly why that happened. It was the improperly adjusted nut behind the wheel again. With that 2.53460 foot, you know, that's the absolute worst one this car has ever made. Even if I ran this car's all-time fastest 60 foot of a 201, I'd still be a half second slower than my best ET. Miles per hour is down considerably, so beyond my mistakes driving, there's obviously a lot more wrong with my tune. Let's grab Tuntus and see what the heck it was. I reduced the wastegate duty cycle for the first and second gears before I made this pass trying to take some of the peak out of my shift points, essentially lowering the boost. For whatever reason, tonight the car just made 2 PSI more than it ever does everywhere in 3rd and 4th. And we'll look at that. We're, we're going to turn on RPMs, Speed, Omni 4 Bar, which is my map sensor, and throttle position. And why not? We'll turn on knock. I hate the color and shape of the vehicle speed line. It's hard to see. I'm going to change that. Better? Now, immediately, the green throttle position line says that my foot's all over the place in first and second gear, trying to gather it back up because I'm not in the groove. 
I backed off in first, trying to reel it back in, kind of saved it, then totally lost it all again and grabbed second. Broke traction at only 3 PSI. I'm launching with zero. This car makes as much as 8 whole PSI in first gear, and that's it. And it can't stick it either. It spins. I'm half throttle trying to prevent it all the way to the 60 foot, but the RPMs still stay pegged at the rev limiter the whole time. Everywhere where you see a hump on the vehicle speed, that's wheel spin. You'll see the horsepower and torque estimates create ridiculous numbers wherever that happens too. That's like doing your math backwards, wheel spin confirmed. Spun all over the place in first and second, and now you can see on the white boost line at 5,500 RPMs in second, it's making 22 PSI, and that's up four pounds from where it was before for me, before I turned the wastegate duty cycle down. So I don't know why it's making more boost. The only thing other than my tune that's changed, and this is the only thing I can conclude, you know, I, I'm now using the water methanol kit to its full capacity, everywhere over 15 PSI and completely off below it. It's a progressive controller, but I'm no longer delivering it in a progressive way. When it's on, it's all of it. Now that I've had the chance to fully open up this car on a track, I've finally found out what it does. It makes more boost. You would think more boost, more power. Well, sort of, but not for me today. It's one of the pieces to help me explain this. Aside from 5,500 RPMs being the peakiest part of this engine's power output and the full water methanol blast, once I got into third gear with it, you'll see where it didn't help me because I'm going to show you, you'll, you'll see. You can see that as I progress through third gear, just about every part of it is lean. AFR EST is asking for between 10.8 to 10.6, but it's reading 11.5 to 11.1, so it's over a half point lean in places. I see that boost number, and I know that I need to go right to my speed density tab. I'm going to grab my VE table, which I've explained in other videos, track the cells that I'm sampling from wherever I am in the log, and put that on top to show you where, you know, why my boost made me slower. Because it's making several more pounds than before, it pushed me into cells on this table that I've never even used. You see that? And therefore, never tuned. Here in third gear at 100% duty cycle on the wastegate, immediately, it's obvious. I made more boost tonight than I've ever been able to make at this point in my previous tuning. I ran slap out of tuned cells to sample from. My map sensor sent my sample off into no man's land in the VE table, so I went lean because this is all new territory to where it's sampling from. I mean, congratulations and all, but being lean is why it was off power, and that's why my timing got pulled. I turned on the knock value because I want to show you here. Knock tends to build off of itself, and it takes a good long time for that timing to come back after the ECU pulls it. You know, it doesn't want to give it to you. You might be done with the gear by the time, like this example proves here, but you can see how it's a couple degrees retarded for most all of third. I think there's more than just one event that's contributing to that knock starting and causing that. Because I made more boost than ever before, I'm pretty sure that changed things for my load factor scale as well. Timings based off the engine's calculated load factor and that turbo and methanol injection kit produced more wind, so that load factor is going to go up too. Here's the timing max octane tab that we're looking at here. And when I do the same thing as we did with the VE table and track it, sure enough, I find there's a seven right where the knock hits. And it's kind of dangling right out here in the open between all the other sixes. I'm gonna knock that one down and also it's other little friend here, the six that's surrounded by fives. That ought to take the edge off a bit where my ECU says that it knocked. And it looks like the ECU pulled two degrees, but I only knocked two different cells down one degree because smaller changes are better here. Like I said, knock likes to build off of itself. If it knocks again at 25 PSI, I'll knock another degree off of the offending cell and try again, but now that I got a chance to use these, I know better. In order to continue my night, I just repeated the values of the cells above the next two rows, turned down the boost a little bit more in first and second, and I said I did that earlier when I meant second and third, but this is really when I did the first and second gear changes. I lined back up again to try to see what it would get me, but it was pointless. They finished the other lanes in the bracket series, someone wrecked, and then they closed the track before 10.30. Seven hours of my day, one pass. Nothing anyone can do about that. On the drive home, I had plenty of time to reflect on all of it and how good my LED headlights work versus the old Invisibeams. How perfect my alignment feels and how well the added caster in these Yoshi Fab camber plates just keeps it pointed straight ahead. 
how when I spin one tire, it no longer results in a surprise lane change at highway speeds, and how bumpy those 600-pound rear springs really are. They're great for drag racing, but they're not at all great at 70 miles an hour on the highway. Fixing the window regulator before the state inspection was a great move, because my driver's side headlight alignment managed to squeak by unnoticed somehow. It probably shouldn't have. I got lucky, I guess, but probably because it's the only thing about the whole car that hit that gray area in the, ch in the inspection. I can align it. All these events tonight needed to happen exactly the way they were, and therefore all I can conclude is that all of my failures tonight were raging successes. Nobody ever had to leave the track in an ambulance. I'm just grateful that none of us ended up with expensive repairs or on our lids. Everything that failed, especially the people, failed perfectly enough to live and fight another day, and that's really all that matters to me. Learning's fun. So's my job here. I'll wait to make a pass if we all learn something from it. I learned that I need a completely different power steering system, though. And there it is in that box. I miss making videos like this one, but obviously it's time for me to do something different. I'll never get through the tune like this. While I'm sitting here rolling down the highway deep inside, I'm really pumped about what I've already done to address all of this for YouTubes. Once again, this video has no mid-roll ads because it's sponsored by Patreon, my pit crew. I've got some gigantic news coming soon that they already know about. If you want to know more about what's coming and support my endeavors creating it, the link is in the description. So thanks for watching everybody and stay tubed.